I met up with Professor Yu Guangyong recently, and uh, what he told me really inspired me to make this video. Professor Yun is the head of the Department of Microbiology at the Hong Kong University. In 2003, he discovered the agent that caused the SARS virus and was subsequently involved in the tackling of that crisis. And of course, today with COVID-19, he's very much in the forefront and in the news almost every day. The first question I asked him was, what's going to happen after COVID-19? Is the world going to be very different? Are we going to live very different lifestyles? I think the world and Hong Kong will not be the same after this pandemic. The reason is because now everybody realizes that the global population is just too high. And the global population mobility is also too high. Which means that any infection that emerges in one very remote part of the world can rapidly spread to all parts of the world within a very short period of time. So, in fact, it these pandemic illustrate very clearly. Maybe the virus comes from a bat or other animal in some very, very remote parts, even in Africa or some the very rural parts of Southeast Asia. So because of the need for the wild animal game food, it go to some parts in China, especially in Wuhan, and from then on it spread rapidly from Wuhan to all parts of China and all parts of the developing world mm -hmm. where the plane, I mean the air flights yeah. can go. Now so once that happened, the world know, now know that we can no longer function like what we have been functioning in the past. In the past, the air travel is a norm. It's very easy to get on a plane and then go to another place. So within the six to eight hours, you go thousands of miles away from your home. I believe that there would be a lot of restrictions, uh, a lot of testing, uh, and you won't really travel easily. So because there will be a lot of border or customs mm. examination, mm. sure that you are not carrying certain things. We are allowed to travel at all. Mm. But I'm sure that the amount of traveling, mm -hmm. the time taken for traveling, the expense of traveling would markedly increase. Wow. Okay. I think that is for sure. Uh, the second thing is that the trade, because not just uh, the mobility of people carries emerging infections. Cargoes also can carry a lot of things. The food, especially uncooked food. Uh, the mosquitoes and other arthropods we carried on the cargoes from one place to another. And the best known example is dengue. The mosquitoes stay on the cargoes and then transport it from yeah, one place yeah, to yeah, another. Yeah. Uh, so even the trade, uh, the requirement in trade would be much stringent, Thank much more stringent. From now on. So the whole world would now look at one just one thing. How to decrease the risk of population mobility. And, and that involves a lot of tourism, a lot of uh, business, uh, a lot of trading. Right. Wouldn't say for example developing a vaccine be an answer? I don't think that answers everything. A vaccine could only solve the problem of COVID nineteen right. if it is safe and effective. But we now know that these sort of pandemics comes now become more and more frequent. Uh, if you look back, the 2003 SARS is 2003 SARS is almost a pandemic, and then in 2009 later you already have like human spine influenza pandemic in 2001, and now you're talking only about another 11 years later you have the COVID-19. Uh, so it's becoming more and more frequent. I mean, Remember last time, I mean, in 1918, the Spanish flu. It's only after 34 years, in 1957, uh, that you have, uh, 39 years later, basically, then you have a, a pandemic influenza H2N2. So you, you can see that the 39 years in the past, you have one pandemic. Now, within 11 years, you 
2009, the pandemic H1N1, 2, the 2019, the pandemic COVID-19. Well, so you can see the frequency is getting worse, I must say. Mm. And uh, everybody now, I mean, after this major pandemic, I think every country and uh, would equip their citizen with something called, I call it a pandemic or epidemic combat kit. So everybody would have a few reusable masks. Mm -hmm. Everybody would mm -hmm. get a face shield which is reusable and uh, even the gowns or touchers mm -hmm. or they don't have to mm -hmm. touch anything. Everybody would have hand sanitized at home. So I think the, the way that uh, we uh, prepare will be different. And the way that we relate to each other will be different. Say, for example, we would tend not to shake hands anymore. <laughs> I mean, touching other people is, is involved. This is going to stay. And we are all now that the saliva and the secretions mm. are dangerous. Mm -hmm. yes. And we know that environmental hygiene will be very important. Now, so with this, with the understanding of the, all this, the our relationship would be different. Mm -hmm. The human touch would be markedly mm -hmm. decreased. Mm -hmm. Internet and the use of uh, other the remote mm -hmm. sensing device or remote communication device would be much more used and much more global. Mm -hmm. How about our food choices? The things that we eat. I mean, the, us as being Chinese have been blamed for eating exotic animals. Is there any truth in that? I'm sure that the, the mainland China government would uh, really be very strict on this from then on. And uh, from a nutritional point of view, I see no reason why the, we should eat dogs and cats or other the wild animals. So I think the animal protection, uh, in fact, would probably get better. Right, right. Uh, because it's we know thing. that you should not get all these pangolins and seabirds. Uh, from then on, I, I think this trade would go down because now everybody knows that the risk is real. And what going to what it's, it's really dangerous. Yeah, yeah. In the past, they all think that SARS is just a one time thing. Nobody believed that it would come back, okay. except myself and <laughs> other scientists, I'm sure. Uh, and, and it proves that it really can come back. So from then on, I think uh, the, the attitude of people towards the eating of exotic wow animals mm. would be quite different from mm. the past. Mm. Mm. And, and also wildlife in wet markets. In yes. Sure. Yeah. And I don't think wildlife would ever be allowed in the wet market. Mm. In, in fact, I always say that even poultry should not be allowed. I mean, more blooded animals, more blooded vertebrates should not be allowed. Mm. So as, as everyday people, if we go to a, say, Wan Chai Gai Si, you know, the food market, and we, we smell the place is bad and we see live animals, we, we really, to protect ourselves, we really should leave, should we not? It's, it's, is it dangerous to visit these places? I always say that the market is not a farm. Farms are regulated by many regulations of farm security, uh, hygiene, exactly. So they have this code of practice. The markets have no code of practice yeah. in terms of farm security. And you allow animals there, the, their fecal material will all be there, and uh, when you slaughter them, there will be a lot of blood and things coming out, and that makes the marketplace a very dangerous place yeah. if you have wild animals there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, was, I remember talking to you once about um, you know developing um, a, a, an effective way or efficient way to test whether or not you you have the virus or antibodies or that sort of thing. Um, you mentioned that the Hong Kong University has developed a special procedure that very accurately and quickly, effectively, diagnose possible patients. Hong Kong University's innovation is mainly the sampling. Mm. The test is the same. It's what we call a genetic test, or RT-PCR, we call reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. It basically amplifies the gene of the COVID-19 virus so that it become detectable. Now, but in order to do this test, you must get the patient sample. Um, the RT-PCR reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction is the standard test for detecting the COVID-19 virus uh, by amplifying a segment of the gene inside this virus. Now, but in order to do this, you must get a sample from the patient. 
And the standard sample is the nasal pharyngeal swab in which you put a swab deep inside the nose, very deep of oh. the yellow. Mm. Right? But that, that, that is very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, it in, induces sneezing and cold. And that is okay. dangerous to the doctors and nurses right. who right. is trying to take a swab from you. Nobody likes it. The patient doesn't like it, doctor and nurses doesn't like it. Mm. And now with the pandemic, there is a shortage of these swaps, uh, which is also not inexpensive. And what Hong Kong University did is we advise patients to take the specimen themselves. Mm. So we give them a container, a sputum container, and then we give the patient to the patient, tell the patient to go home first. And then tomorrow morning, the first thing in the morning when the patient awake, before breakfast and before uh, rinsing the mouth, they have to cough out the deep throat secretions, all right, by a maneuver, a clearing of the mm -hmm. and then get the deep throat saliva into the container. Mm -hmm. And we advise them to cough or clear the throat at least five to 10 times, so that you have sufficient amount of these deep throat secretions. In, into the container, also containing the viral transfer medium. Mm -hmm. Then they close the container and then send it back to the hospital or the clinic. And then it is sent to the laboratory for testing by the RT-PCR. Mm -hmm. And we find that by doing this, this is at least as sensitive as using the nasal pharyngeal swab. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are now more and more publications showing that uh, by using this deep throat saliva or deep throat secretions, it is actually more accurate than a nasal pharyngeal swab because sampling the nasal pharyngeal swab is only once or the throat you can only do it once because it is so comfortable yeah. and if that uh, sampling is not that optimal the amount of infected cell or virus is very low whereas for when you cough out your different saliva which comes from both the nose posterior because when you're lying down all this postation drip go to your throat and when you are sleeping the secretions that you usually would carry up from the lung into the throat would not be taken away there. so both collect here then you cough it you can cough it out for five to ten times so it's five to ten sampling the swab is only one sampling mm -hmm. and as expected it is actually better more accurate now, so this is an innovation from Hong Kong University. It's now basically proven to be as useful. And in fact, the uh, United States FDA approved the saliva yes. uh, the genetic test uh, for COVID-19, one, one company. And uh, the Yale University also published a paper uh, saying that it is actually more accurate. And recently, uh, in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, they have done uh, hundreds of samples showing the same conclusion. Actually, the different saliva is better than the nasal pharyngeal swab or throat swab. There has been a lot of conflicting reports as to how Hong Kong has handled this crisis. There has been four deaths, which is a relatively low figure compared with other countries. So I took the opportunity to ask Professor Yun his opinion. Scientists doesn't uh, talk about uh, emotional yeah. or impression. Yeah. Yeah. It's obvious that uh, in terms of number of cases, the uh, population, we are some of the best in the world. I think Hong Kong is uh, uh, the, the, among the top three the, together with the uh, regions, Taiwan and yeah, also Macau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and deaths, uh, we only have four deaths out of 1,050 cases, which is a uh, world well record. I mean, it's so uh -huh. low. Uh, so uh, to me, we are performing very well. Yeah, we haven't even had a lockdown. I mean, people will never lock in the house. Well, we home. do have city lockdown at home. <laughs> and I think that is related, mostly related to our another innovation. And that innovation is called universal masking. So uh, what, what we see is actually the early on uh, at the end, near the end of January, uh, the staff of Hong Kong University and the Department of Microbiology is already telling everyone in Hong Kong to wear a mask mm -hmm. and do hand hygiene. Universal marketing is one right. that all the other countries did not do, except of course later also in China. Now, even in China, even in mainland China at the beginning, when Hong Kong is stepping up the level of alertness, the level of epidemic control to serious level, 
uh, that is, uh, I think it's around 24th of uh, January. There are media in even China said that we are exploiting the epidemic for political mm. reasons. There is even criticism uh, from the media, uh, both in locally and also in mainland China. But that proves to be the mm -hmm. most correct thing that Hong Kong has done. Yes, yes. Everybody get alerted, and then we say that everybody should wear a mask. And actually, other other places follow us. Actually, the, the, the other like Taiwan, yes. they follow yes. us. The mainland yes. is also following yes. us. Yes. And of course, Macau. Uh, right. they, they, although they do, they close the border earlier than Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but they also uh, follow us in terms of universal masking. Now you can see that. Every country, at different time to different extent, always control the border, always do testing and isolate the contact, always do contact tracing and quarantine the contact, always uh, ask people to do hand hygiene and also do social distancing by school closure, home office, uh, cancellation of uh, get mass gathering, and extremely in the extreme cases, a city lockdown. Now that is what other people do. Hong Kong do the same actually, but there's one thing Hong Kong do, but Hong Kong does, but other places did not, and that is universal masking yeah, yeah. or community masking. And I must tell you that Hong Kong people were so compliant. <laughs> we are talking about 97 percent of the people on the streets in the morning time, rush hour, going back to work. 97 percent of them are wearing masks. Now that explains why Hong Kong. Having the most dense population in the whole world, having at least 150,000 people crossing the border between, especially between Maine and Hong Kong, every day, and still can be able to withstand this pandemic during the winter time. All right, that is really a world record. I, I think the universal masking is something that uh, Hong Kong has learned because we now know very well that the saliva contain a lot of viral particles. And when you don't wear a mask, when you're talking, all the saliva goes around uh, your surroundings, and your hands, your fingers. Then when you shake hands with people, you touch other things, the virus is being spread out. Mm -hmm. Now, hand hygiene is excellent. The hand hygiene is a discontinuous process. You wash your hands now, next minute, you can immediately contaminate your hands with your own saliva. Mm -hmm. And that's why the hand hygiene alone is not good. Mm -hmm. But if you wear a mask, which is a continuous protective process, all your saliva won't come out. Your hands will not be easily contaminated. The environment that you go around will not be contaminated. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can see that universal masking should be much more effective than hand hygiene. Four deaths is already four deaths too many. What do you think we could have done to perfect it and have zero deaths? The most important thing is extensive testing. Mm -hmm. Extensive testing, then the cases will be identified early. And then when they go to the hospital, they receive the treatment early. Now Hong Kong is very early already, then that's why there's only four deaths. But you know that at the moment when in Hong Kong, uh, the third Indonesian Hong Kong, a triple antiviral combination, we find that our triple antiviral combination, drug combination, would only be effective if it is given early, within mm -hmm. seven days of symptom onset, is the most effective. Now, so unless you identify case early, send them to the hospital, and then give the combination antiviral drug treatment early, then you will have no deaths, that nobody will die. So that is the third innovation of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Also from Hong Kong, you probably invented <laughs> The fact that we so few of us are infected is not a good thing because of herd immunity and all that. The fact that there are some societies where there are a lot of people infected and if they will develop the antibodies before us in Hong Kong. I mean, unless we don't allow Americans or whoever to visit Hong Kong, how, how are we going to overcome this lack of you know, antibodies? I think the first thing is that we are waiting for the vaccine. If you have a highly effective and safe vaccine, then you don't need the mask. And then in terms of trading or let people come in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. it's also very easy. Mm -hmm. You ask the person to test it first, seven days, within seven days yeah. before you get onto the plane. Mm -hmm. 
And then when you arrive in Hong Kong, you have another test again. If you have no virus, then you, you can allow them to go around with a mask. That will be okay. safe for Hong Kong, right. safe, for the, safe for them too. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you need to stop people from coming to Hong Kong. In fact, Hong Kong has never stopped anyone entering Hong Kong. You can always come, but you have to have 14 days quarantine. But in the future, you can't ask people to come and save us 14 days inside quarantine camp. No. So testing before you come, testing when you arrive. If you're negative, wear a mask, go yeah. around. What is the thing about Q1 actually? A Q is when you got the disease already. Yeah. And then you use a drug to suppress the virus, get rid of the virus. Mm -hmm. A vaccine is for prevention. Okay. All right? It, you haven't got the right. disease yet. And you have the vaccine, and then when you are exposed to yeah, yeah. Uh, patients, uh, the, the patient cannot do any harm to you. Okay, so there's a lot of talk about vaccine. I don't hear a lot of talk about cure. Should we? Is there a cure? Remdesivir is talked about a lot. Uh -huh. So that they believe that that may be infected. But uh -huh. in fact, these clinical trials with thousands of people show that it doesn't really clearly decrease the mortality. Mm. Uh, it just the decrease the is short in the hospitalization, that's right, that's right. which actually demonstrated very clearly that it is early treatment that is important. Right. If you give early, the patient do well and then get out of hospital early. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately for those who die, they are the serious cases, they are usually delayed yeah. in terms of diagnosis mm -hmm. and hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And by the time you give the remdesivir, it's not going to work. Okay. And that's why it doesn't decrease the mortality. I think for our triple combination therapy, we have the same problem. Right, right. If you don't give it early, it's going to work. Right, right. And the reason why we have so low mortality is because Hong Kong, the law, uh, the public health law uh, ordinance requires that everyone that has the virus has to be isolated in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if directly they're given a high chance of giving the antiviral combination treatment. Is the virus, is this pandemic a kind of flu? Is, can it be compared with the flu? It's different. First, the mortality is at least uh, 10 times higher. So in terms of influenza, for example, seasonal influenza, the mortality is around 0.1%. But this virus is at least 1% or higher. Mm -hmm. At least. Mm -hmm. Right now, we still do not know the exact uh, tip of the eyes, but how much uh, mildly symptomatic cases are there or asymptomatic yeah, cases. Okay. You only have those who are documented by yeah. laboratory testing. Yeah. Yeah. And for that, the mortality rate ranges from yeah. 4% in Hong Kong yeah. Yeah. to 7% in Italy and, uh, and Europe. Yeah. So the range is very I mean, I hear you talk about how in Hong Kong there is not enough testing, and yet the mortality rate is so low. Whereas in countries like Italy, the reason why the mortality rate is so high is because there's very little testing. By the time they're tested, they're already infected. Yes. And then they go with the hospital very late. And in, in their locality, they, they ask you people who are fever to stay at home. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, don't go out, don't go in, there are people. Until you're breathless, you're feeling very unwell, then you go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that is very late. Mm -hmm. Even if you go in the hospital, it's not very much, it's not beautiful. And of course, uh, even if you're intubated or ventilated, still a half of them die. Mm. And, and, that, and that's a price to pay because you don't test them early and you don't treat them early. Mm. Hong Kong, I mean, at least for the symptomatic cases, all are tested already. Although I still think that the amount of testing is not enough. Yeah. Right? They are testing about 2,000 a day. I think about 7,000 would be much better. Uh, but uh, the government has their own difficulties. I think that just about covers everything. Thank you very much um, for clearing up a lot of mysteries and you know a lot of conspiracy theories are swirling around, and it, it's just really interesting to hear a world expert like yourself uh, talk to us. So thank you very much, Professor. Yin. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so after my chat with Professor Yun, I do feel that the world is going to be different post COVID nineteen. The way we work, the way we contact each other, the way we travel, the tourism industry, all that. I wish everybody good health and thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.